Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> so many jokes. But. <laughs> no, it's just you and Jackie are matching. Oh, okay, Jackie. All right, got the memo. So I want to say, start by saying that today is the Biden-Harris administration 500th briefing. Yay. I know you guys are excited. <laughs> and then from now until the end of our term, we will do 500 more. I'm just kidding. Can you imagine? Anyway, guys, all kidding aside. So we've shared a lot of moments together and important exchanges. We are proud to be a White House that understands the importance of the role you all play. As President Biden has said, a free press is a pillar of our democracy. And so really happy to do this exercise with you almost every day from, from here, from this podium behind this lectern. And really, the freedom of the press is so incredibly important. And I think what we do almost every day shines a light to the world of how democracy works. And so thank you. Uh, thank you all for, for uh, participating in that. Um, and we appreciate the, the journalistic work that you all do. Today, the Senate took a major bipartisan step forward in making our kids safer online as our nation grapples with an unprecedented youth mental health crisis, there is undeniable evidence that social media and other online platforms have contributed to it. As the president said today in his statement, our children are subjected to a wild west online with virtually no limits of regulation, and it's past time to address that. It's exactly why he has made tackling the mental health crisis a key priority of this unity agenda for the nation. It's an issue that cuts across politics and affects red states and blue states, and it's why the administration has invested historic resources, launched new tools to ensure people can just can, can get the help they need and has consistently called on Congress to work together in a bipartisan way on solutions. This bill does what the president called for in, the, in, in his first State of the Union address. It strengthens privacy protections, bans targeted advertising to children, and demands tech companies stop collecting personal data on our children. As the president said, our kids have been waiting too long for the safety and privacy protections they deserve and, with, and which this bill provides. And he is pleased with the overwhelming bipartisan vote in the Senate and encourages the House to send this bill to his desk for his signature without delay. We continue to pray for the thousands of Americans under mandatory evacuations orders as wildlife continues, wildfires continues to devastate communities across the Western United States. The president has been briefed on the fires, including the Park Fire in California and the fires in Oregon. As of July 30th, over 7,000 federal personnel from the U.S. Forest Service and the Department of the Interior are on the ground across California and the Pacific Northwest, helping fight the, bl the blaze and keep people safe, including more than 620 personnel assigned to both the park and boro fires in California. Numerous firefighting air tankers are flying and are flying fire suppression missions as conditions allow and the Department of Defense has mobilized four of its C-130 modular airborne firefighting systems to support fire suppression efforts. DOD has has also begun training National Guard troops sh should they be requested by governors to assist with fire suppression. And they are supporting California State National Guard operators early and rapid detec detection of new fire starts. Additional, additionally, FEMA has issued several fire management assistant grants to help reimburse states for firefighting costs. As always, we stand ready to provide further support as needed. Today, the 59th anniversary of Medicare and Medicaid, two programs that have given tens of millions of Americans the security and dignity of affordable health care coverage. Nearly 140 million Americans benefit from these programs, yet still Republicans in Congress have proposed budget cuts and, and slashes to these critical programs and endorse extreme policies of Project 2025 that would slash Medicaid funding and cut Medicare benefits like the President's Medicare drug 
price negotiation program. The contrast is clear. The Biden-Harris administration is committed to protecting and strengthening these programs, like making sure children and pregnant women covered by Medicaid have coverage for a full year. And we are committed to making health care more affordable and accessible for all, including the one million people newly covered under the ACA's Medicaid expansion since the president and vice president took over. Now think about uh, the Inflation Reduction Act and what that does. It allows Medicare to negotiate lower prices on prescription drugs, caps out-of-pocket drug costs at $2,000 per year, saving Medicare ben beneficiaries thousands of dollars annually, and provides Medicaid and Medicare beneficiaries with free vaccines. And under President Biden and Vice President Harris, more people have health insurance than ever before. So today, we recognize the anniversary of Medicare, Medicaid. We affirm our commitment to build on this program, protect access to these programs from Republican elected officials, extreme attacks. With that, I appreciate your patience. Colleen, how did you, what time did you get home last night? 145. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's do this. It's a rough morning. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, too. I see Matt back there. And <laughs> too. Um, so can you give us an update on where Venice, on where the U.S. stands uh, on the Venezuela elections? Um, in particular, I know the president is speaking with President Lula of Brazil later, but um, just wondering if there's any progress on how uh, the U.S. is trying to decide you know, what to do. So a couple of things. I believe right before I walked out, a statement from the National Security Council spokes uh, went out, so certainly refer you to that. But just to give you a little bit of what that what was in that statement, Obviously, the U.S. has been closely monitoring uh, Venezuela's presidential election that took place on Sunday and the subsequent announcements by Venezuela's National Electoral Council. First, let me say that the U.S. applauds the Venezuelan people for their courage and commitment to democracy by participating in this election in the face of repression and adversity. So we continue to call on Venezuela's electoral authorities to release full transparent and detailed voting results, including by polling uh, stations as well. This especially critical. This is especially critical given that there are clear signs that the election results announced by the Venezuela's National Electoral Council do not reflect the will of the Venezuelan people as it was expressed at the ballot box on July 28th. We are also reviewing other electoral data shared by civil society organizations and the reports of international election monitors. The United States stands on the side of the democratic aspirations of the Venezuela people, including supporting their right to express their views freely and without uh, reprisal. So that is where we stand. Uh, and again, we're just going to not get ahead of that. But we've been very clear, very clear about the uh, election results. Um, can you help us understand a little bit uh, about what the president was talking about last night? He was asked um, when he'd go campaign for Vice President Harris, and he said, well, I did today. Um, I was wondering if there was, was yesterday, uh, was there a campaign element to yesterday? Was he sort of talking broadly? I, I, just wonder if you could help us. So, um, as 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 you know, the president gave a little. Is this when he when we came back at 1:15 a.m. and okay, 1:15 a.m. on the South Lawn, the president took a couple of uh, your colleagues' questions. Um, I think he was. I did not ask him about that particular answer. My guess is he was speaking more broadly. Um, look. At the end of the day, I'm not going to speak for the campaign, I'm not going to speak to the president's campaigning schedule. That is something for the campaign to speak to. But they are partners in this administration, uh, the president and the vice president. As you know, we announced uh, SCOTUS reform in at LBJ, um, uh, LBJ Library just yesterday in Austin, and that was an important moment. Uh, that was an important moment to talk about where we are today. And the president met the moment talking about how no one is above the law here and how important the rule of law. I just started uh, this top, the, the top of the briefing talking about how it's so important to have the freedom of the press, right? And how we've had our, this is the 500th briefing. It is also important for our democracy. And so obviously the president was, and the vice president were um, uh, partners in making that announcement in the sense of how they were going to move forward of the three things that he laid out uh, on what reform looks like uh, for this administration as it relates to the campaign. Don't have anything specific to share, but this is certainly um, uh, the Biden-Harris uh, administration 
and everything that we have done uh, the past three and a half years, we want to continue to do moving forward and continue to work on behalf of the American people. Okay. Thanks, Green. Last night, the president said he's been talking to the vice president about her potential running mate. Could you just explain how often they've been talking to each other and when's the last time they spoke? So I, I'm going to be super careful, um, uh, not going to speak to uh, the running mate or anything like that. Uh, I'm not going to go beyond what the president uh, shared. Uh, what I can say is, the, and I have said this before, the president and the vice president talk regularly. They actually spoke um, uh, about a day or two ago. Uh, they stay in touch uh, and, uh, and that's going to continue as they as they not just because obviously the, the vice president is running but that's going to continue because as i said she's a critical partner in what they do uh, but they do speak regularly is and there, i can assure you is there any color you could add about the kind of conversations if there's you know counseling the president advice he's been sharing with his vice president so i'll say this um uh, the president has been uh, in the public service, as you know, for more than 54 years as a senator, as vice president. He had the role, as you all know, for eight years uh, as vice president, and now he is president for three and a half years and six more, six more, six more months of his term. And um, I think, as um, you know, as a, a leader of the Democratic Party as well, I think he always offers up um, advice. Uh, any type of uh, little bit of wisdom that he has uh, with uh, experience uh, on these multiple fronts that he's been able to lead uh, this country. And so, you know, I think he's that is certainly a role that he plays as well with the vice president. I'm not going to speak to the campaign, but certainly uh, when the vice president became vice president herself, he offered his advice, his opinion, uh, and also I, I, I would say was a mentor to her, uh, but certainly not going to go beyond beyond that. And where is the president when it comes to picking a new Secret Service director? Is this a very short list? Is he really broadening the search? Yeah, I think I was asked this question yesterday or, or very recently. Look, the president understands how important it is uh, to fulfill this role, uh, to uh, to have someone who's experienced, uh, and so he's taking this very seriously, like he does any other appointment that he makes within uh, within the administration. Don't have anything for you on timing, on timeline. Uh, we don't have a personal announcement for you uh, today, but certainly the president's taking this very seriously. And when we have uh, locked in someone ready to make that announcement, uh, we'll, we'll, certainly you all will know about it. Go ahead, you. You like ruined the first role. Yeah. What did I? Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize to, to you Reuters. and to everyone always, for that. Yes, it's I, always Reuters. Last time it was Steve. I take <laughs> take full blame for that. Um, but we love you anyway. The uh, uh, Israeli strikes in Lebanon um, uh, today. Uh, do you view them as escalatory? Do you think they're an appropriate response to what we saw? previously? So uh, obviously we are aware of the reports out there that the IDF just conducted a strike against uh, Hezbollah uh, in Lebanon and uh, I leave it to Israel to speak for uh, their own military operations. I do not have an immediate uh, comment as this just happened, literally just happened uh, a few minutes before I walked out. So I'm going to leave uh, Israel to, to certainly IDF uh, as they have been doing to respond to this and, and just don't have an immediate comment at this time. And then just to follow up on, on Colleen's question yeah. earlier, the, the Lula call today, yeah. is oh, there... Yeah, I didn't, I'm sorry, Colleen, I didn't touch on that. Is there any expectation that, that there's going to be some prep as far as sanctions are concerned or is I mean is there what is the Venezuela content of that oh okay so let me just say and I think we shared this all with all of you that the president was going to be speaking with the president of Brazil and so they're going to discuss a number of issues and like we normally do we will certainly have uh, a readout for all of you so look we are as it relates to Venezuela, we are obviously in the process of evaluating the Maduro and his representatives uh, do next, and we will respond accordingly. And uh, so while I have nothing to announce today as it relates to sanctions or moving forward, uh, we will continue to assess our, our calibrated sanctions policy towards Venezuela in light of, of overall U.S. interest, the actions and non-actions that are taken by uh, Maduro and his representatives, and the overall direction of the, our broader U.S. Uh, bilateral engagement with Venezuela. And so, again, don't want to get ahead of, of where we are at this, at this time. Go ahead, Daniel. 
Thanks, Green. Um, just going back to Israel, if I may, um, Kirby said yesterday that fears of an all-out war between Israel and Hezbollah were exaggerated. Um, is that still the White House's assessment after today's uh, strike? So we do not believe uh, that an all-out war is inevitable. That is not something that we believe, and we believe that it can still be avoided. Uh, you know, uh, this is a president, as you, you've watched him the last three and a half years, he believes in diplomacy, diplomatic solutions, uh, especially as we're talking in this moment along the blue line, that, that is t true as well. And so, um, and that will end these attacks if we have some diplomatic uh, kind of solution from Hezbollah once and for all and allow Israel and Lebanese citizens on both sides of the border to return to their homes and live and live and live in, in in safety and that's what we want to see so we that's what we believe there's a diplomatic solution here and that's what we're trying to get to and will the white house be reaching out again to israel in the wake of this strike too so look i don't have any uh again immediate reactions to this or immediate comments from us on this we regularly talk to our counterparts here uh regularly talk to um uh our is israeli uh counterparts our government our counterparts there our counterparts there and so that will continue uh, that is a regular daily uh, conversation I just want to be really mindful I just don't have an immediate comment uh, to today can we show so what reason do you and the president have to believe that there is a diplomatic solution here? because we have to uh, you know continue to be optimistic here I think it's important uh, to have a diplomatic solution. We do not want to see an escalation. We do not want to see an all-out war. Those conversations happening happen, the diplomatic conversations. So obviously, I'm not going to get into uh, private discussions from here, uh, but it is important. It is important for the people of Israel. It is important for uh, the Lebanese people to live in safety, to get back to their homes, and that's what we want to see. And then um, following up on something else the president said yesterday okay. when he was asked about Supreme Court reform. Yes. What did he mean when he said that Speaker Johnson is dead on arrival? So look, he actually addressed this right uh, in his speech, in his remarks. Uh, yesterday he, he went right to it uh, and talked about how um, his idea basically was uh, dead on arrival, the Speaker's idea. He actually talked about it uh, and he said what the Speaker, he reiterated what the Speaker said about the SCOTUS reforms uh, uh, announcement and then he said that his idea was dead on arrival. So uh, I would just refer you to the President himself and how he addressed this directly uh, during his remarks when he was at LBJ uh, Library. So he misspoke? I don't think he misspoke. I think he, he, clear, he cleared what he meant specifically so people understood. I would not say he misspoke. I think I mean, he... Actually, when he said, I think uh, well, that's what he is. I, I, look, let's be very clear. He spoke while he landed, while he was, well, after we landed, getting off the Air Force One, uh, and he gets shouted questions, and he responded. He just wanted to be really clear what he meant by dead on arrival. Those, you, you've been there. You know how it happens. It goes back and forth. People can't really hear him sometimes. He can't hear you all, uh, and that is something he wanted to make sure he was clear on his statement, but that was always his intent when he answered that question. Thank you, Crane. Yeah. Oh, gotcha. Thank you, Crane. Is this Supreme Court proposal just an election year gambit? I will say this. Um, I think if you read the Washington Post op-ed that the president put out yesterday, if you listen to his speech, he was reacting to what SCOTUS has been doing over the past, not just past couple of weeks, but certainly in the last two years, starting from Dobbs and so many other uh, important decisions that come, have to come out of um, come out of the Supreme Court. The Dobbs decision certainly uh, was something that we talked about just two years ago, and he had a commission uh, to take a look at the Supreme Court. Uh, he certainly appreciated the commission and what they did and the work that they've done. But when you have you know, a Supreme Court, and the president actually gave, gave uh, examples, right, of what the decision of immunity uh, that they made recently, what that means for the president of the United States, you know, and what we're seeing right now is not normal. And majority of Americans agree with us, right? What we're seeing that the Supreme Court is not normal. Uh, and the president spoke to that at length. Uh, he, he went to uh, the LBJ library because of the historic nature of that, of that library, the 60th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act. Uh, and there's, there's so much here that's at stake. And so that's why he wanted to do this. Uh, this is about the right thing to do. This is about meeting the moment that we're in. This is about reacting 
to what the, the, the SCOTUS did. He said in his op-ed, American democracy is founded on the rule of law. No one, not the president, not the Supreme Court, are above the law. And uh, in the wake of the Supreme Court ruling, for example, uh, uh, it grants presidents immunity for crimes committed in office and gut fundamental freedoms recognized for more than 50 years. And so he wanted to take action on that. And, but you know, why would he not then read in top Democrats, including the Senate Judiciary Chair, I mean, about this he, effort? Here's the thing. Majority of Americans want to see this. They want to see some form of reform. And the president is certainly want to make sure that he is where we're majority of Americans. I will say, and I talked about this a little bit yesterday when we were in a gaggle, a range of conservative legal experts and Republican elected officials have voiced support, for example, term limits, which was part of what the president laid out yesterday. For, for example, last year, a bipartisan group of legal experts, including retired judges and Charles Freed, Ronald Reagan's Solicitor General, endorsed term limits for the Supreme Court. Stephen Calabrese, the chairman of the Federalist Society who served in the administrations of Presidents Reagan and George H.W. Bush, he also endorsed term limits. You had Marco Rubio, a senator, right now, right, Look, a current senator, endorsed this as well, along with other congressional, uh, congressional Republicans. So there is bipartisan support for this. I'm trying to understand how we got to this in the last week, because you brought up the president's yeah. commission. His commission also found on term limits that um, a statutory uh, change for term limits, for instance, would be inherently unstable, uh, underscored constitutional doubts, uh, said that the composition would create, generate greater uncertainty and distress. The president himself in, on the campaign trail in 2020 uh, said about term limits, uh, presidents come and go. Supreme Court justices stay for generations. Uh, I'm not trying to change that at all. It was two different days he spoke to I this. Mean, so how how did we get there? Here, here's, um, first of all, he he appreciates the commission. He appreciates the work that they've done. Their their job was to give the president some thoughts and ideas. And obviously, the president makes the final decision on how he wants to move forward. We have to look at what the Supreme Courts have done. Two years later, wait, I mean, wait, it, wait, 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 wait. That me, was you 2021. Got, okay, you, guys, you gotta let me answer the question. I'm not done. Let me finish the question. In the past several weeks, the actions that the Supreme Court has taken in undermining democracy and the rule of law, that's important. The, per the president felt he needed to address this. Remember, we were supposed to go to LBJ Library two weeks ago. And we went two weeks ago this past Monday, yesterday. Uh, and so the president still wanted to move forward, still wanted to make sure he addressed this important issue. I mean, just a few weeks. Is these past endorsing eliminating the filibuster then? I, I mean, look, we are, he laid out the three ways that he wants to move forward. We're going to have hopefully a healthy debate with Congress on what this, gonna look, what this is going to look like. This is going to be legislation that we want to move forward with. And, and I will say this, you know, one of the reasons the president ran in 2020 was because of what he saw in Charlottesville, was because of the fear of, uh, you know, wanting to make sure that we protect the soul of our nation. That was part of it. And just look at what's happened, you know, the last, um, you know, the last several years and the actions that the Supreme Court has taken. I, I mean, this is a president that was on the Judiciary Committee for th almost the 36 years that he was president, so right? If you think, yes, on the filibuster. No, I, I actually answered this. I said we're going to have a healthy debate with Congress on what this is going to look like. The president laid out the three ways that he sees moving forward. There's not going to go beyond those three measures that he's laid out, but we're going to have a healthy debate, and that's what's important here. No question. I, I just said we are going to we we. The question we on we welcome, we welcome a, a healthy debate on how to move forward. He put forth three, three ways to move forward on this, on really dealing with SCOTUS reform. And I just laid out some conservative legal experts who agree with us, who agree with us, at least on the term limits. They've been very clear as well. Okay. Former President Trump did an interview where he said that maybe being called a threat to democracy was a cause of his being shot. How would the president respond to that? What I will say is the president has always been very clear when it comes to uh, violent political rhetoric. There is no place, no place uh, here in this country, uh, in our nation for it. He's always spoken about that. He's spoken about that for the past, uh, uh, you know, the past several years throughout his career. And um, 
you know, right after the attempt, assassination attempt, uh, the president said, he even made an address in the, in the Oval Office and talked about lowering the temperature. He talked about getting to the bottom, uh, the bottom of this, having an, an uh, a independent investigation and how important it was to do just that. And, you know, I, I talked about Charlottesville. We saw uh, how the president spoke against January 6th. The day that, um, and I remember this, the day that January 6th happened in 2021, uh, the president was then president-elect. He was supposed to talk about the economy. He took that opportunity to, to denounce what happened. 2,000 2, people went to the Capitol. A mob went to the Capitol. Uh, officers, law enforcement officers were harmed. Uh, uh, some of them lost their lives afterwards. And he condemned that. He condemned the political violence. And they were doing that because uh, they were trying to overturn free and fair elections. When uh, Paul Pelosi was attacked by a hammer, uh, the president also spoke out about uh, uh, you know violent political rhetoric and where we where we will um, you know where what happened, how horrific that was. And violence has no place, no place in this country. So if anything, this is a president has been constantly and proactively called out on all Americans to come together and oppose political violence, uh, regardless of our views, regardless of our views. He's had a little more than a week now to contemplate his change in status, not being a candidate, but being the sitting president. Has he described to you ways he wants to use the time perhaps differently since he doesn't have the campaign obligation? Yeah, I think, look, we have six, six more months left, um, and the president is certainly very much thinking through what that's going to look like as far as delivering for the American people. His job doesn't stop, it continues. We've had an unprecedented record for three and a half years on things that we were able to accomplish, whether it's the economy, being the strongest, uh, having the strongest economy in the world, leading the world, uh, whether it is uh, foreign policy, making sure uh, that uh, we are, uh, again, rebuilding those relationships with our partners and allies. That's something that he's been able to do. You know, healthcare, I just talked about Medicaid and Medicare at the top. There are many ways that the president wants to continue. The Supreme Court reform. Uh, announcement that he made was also a really important majority of the Americans care about that you will hear more from this president he will articulate what the next 180 days or so or less uh, looks like uh, he is going to take this very seriously you see less travel often it's an official event and campaign yeah. coinciding so would he be based here more do you anticipate so look I I think Matt Matt was asking me this question in a gaggle yesterday recalibrating and yes there's a little bit of recalibrating here right and that is that is the honest truth. So we're trying to figure out what that's going to look like. The president is thinking about this in a in a in the way that he does, right? On behalf of the American people, putting them first. And so we'll have certainly more to share. Obviously, the president enjoys being out there, talking directly to the American people. I think that's one of the ways that we are more effective, right, when the president gets out there. Can't speak to the campaign. Uh, that's something that the campaign can speak to. But the president wants to get out there. He wants to speak directly to the American people. He wants to continue to deliver. And you will hear him articulate that more, uh, I would, you know, I will predict uh, in the short and short order. We saw the president meet briefly with uh, Congressman Doggett of, of Texas on the tarmac yesterday. I wondered if he just had a readout of that conversation, given Doggett's yeah. status as the first first Democrat to call for him to withdraw. And, and just broadly speaking, yeah. just does this is the president's relationships with some of these members affected by them if if they they were among you know the thirty or so to call for the president to withdraw before? His I mean, you kind of answer that question yourself. President Doggett was there. At, on the tarmac, reading the president. Uh, I'm not going to go into private conversations. That's something that I do and will do from here. Uh, we've done for the past three and a half years, so we're going to continue with that. Uh, but, I mean, I think you saw you saw them greet each other. But, I mean, this is a president, and I've said this many times, he believes in, you know, reaching across the aisle, for example, and working with Republicans who say he can't get things done. Right. Um, this is a president who understands that the Democratic Party is big and there are many, many thoughts. And that's what makes our party, I think, so unique and important because we have different ideas, because we have different thoughts. Uh, and the president understands, you know, they had their opinion. There were Democrats who had their opinion. 
Uh, he obviously had his, and uh, and he appreciated we were able to have an unprecedented historic record because of the relationships that he's had uh, with these Democratic members. I don't think that will change. I don't think that will change. Going back to the Venezuela. Are you new to the? Yes. Oh. Stephanie. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, Stephanie from Bloomberg. Nice yes. to see you. <laughs> this is your first time in the briefing room? Not my first time. Okay. But I'm asking okay. a question. Oh, so okay. Thank you for that. All right. Here we go. Um, going back to the Venezuelan election. Sure. Is the president using the call with Lula as an intermediary to deal with the election results? And what kind of assurances is he looking for from his Brazilian counterpart about Maduro's promises to release? So uh, they're going to be. I believe speaking shortly, if, they, if it hasn't started uh, with the president of Brazil, uh, they're going to talk about a wide range uh, of issues, obviously. We'll have a readout. Don't want to get ahead of that conversation, ahead of that call. Uh, I, th I think I have said before, and uh, we have said here, that the world is watching. Uh, we're not going to get ahead uh, of the process. I think you saw the statement from my, from an SC spokes. You heard what I said at the top. Uh, and so, uh, you know, uh, and I, I'll add, you know, other other leaders across the country has also called on uh, a full and detailed tabulation votes uh, to be released. And so we've expressed our concerns uh, and not going to get ahead of uh, the readout that's going to come out from the president after his conversation with the, the president of Brazil. But the world is watching, certainly. Does the administration have a reaction to the arrest of Venezuelan opposition figures? Uh, look, um, I'll say this, any political re repression or violence against protesters or, or the opposition is obviously unacceptable. Uh, the United States supports the democratic aspirations of the Venezuelan people and their right to express their views freely and without reprisal. Uh, and so that's where I'll leave it there. Get, get, um, sorry, get April. Oh, yeah. I know, I know, <laughs> I know the mask threw me off. <laughs> um, moving on. Yes. Um, Karine, why is President Biden not going to the NABJ convention after originally thought, and is the Vice President going this week to the NABJ convention? So the NABJ convention decision was done by the campaign, so I would have to refer you to the campaign uh, on on both of your questions about the, the President and uh, the Vice President, as obviously the, the President is no longer a candidate. Uh, so I'm assuming that played a role into it. As far as the vice president, you would have to ask the campaign about her. Well, this is something typically during an election year that uh, presidential candidates do take uh, part of. Is this something that um, is overshadowed because of recent controversies? I mean, is the White House paying attention to the recent controversy about Donald Trump yeah. uh, going there tomorrow? And um, what, if you can tell us. So look, I, I'm certainly not going to comment on the, the former president's uh, campaign stops. That's a campaign stop for him. Uh, and the NABJ, they make the, their own decisions on guests, so certainly that's for them to speak to. What I can say more broadly about us and how we, as an administration, taking away the campaign just as an administration, what we've done for the last three and a half years, uh, we appreciate the importance of speaking to all Americans, including uh, uh, African Americans, Black Americans as well. That's why we have we have always uh, been very, uh, you know, very direct and very focused on speaking to both local and and uh, national Black-owned outlets. That is something that not just the president and the vice president has done. Many of his senior, uh, see their senior folks have done as well, senior White House officials. And so we understand the importance of of uh, Black Americans to hear directly from this administration, and we have done that, and not just uh, black Americans, but all Americans. And so that is certainly something that we will continue to do. Uh, and, uh, and we take that very, very seriously. As far as the NABJ, that is something for them to speak to uh, and, and the campaigns to speak, speak to directly. Again, Michael. Um, Karine, thank you. Um, I want to uh, talk about uh, Israel and Gaza. The regional director for the World Food Program said, right now the biggest challenge is we don't have enough crossing points to bring the food in. We need road access, we need the Rafa crossing to reopen again, we need Karim Shalom to work better, we need law and order. 
Did the president bring that up uh, with Netanyahu at his meeting last week? So look, I don't have anything more to read out to read out to you from what uh, we put out uh, from our readout of, of their conversation. Uh, I will say this, this is why it is so important uh, to get uh, that hostage deal. This is one of the, obviously one of the main point of conversations that the president had uh, with the prime minister. Uh, the president understands how important it is to get a ceasefire. He understands how important it is uh, to get that continue uh, to get uh, humanitarian aid into Gaza. Uh, that is something that the United States has led in that effort. Uh, and so we want to see that. We want to we want to see uh, an influx of humanitarian aid. That's why we've been trying to do this by air, by sea, by land. Uh, and so conversations about the crossings, uh, conversations on making sure uh, trucks go through uh, is certainly uh, uh, daily, regular conversations that our counterparts here have with the Israeli government and will continue to do that. But it is incredibly important to get this uh, ceasefire deal and we've been working on this 24-7 and uh, you know I'll say this uh, and, and we've said this before the gaps have certainly narrowed uh, and that's important but there's still some work to do and we're going to get to that work and, and try to make sure uh, we do everything that we can to get this done. Is the US worried that an increased Israeli focus on fighting in the north could lead to a worsening humanitarian situation in the Gaza Strip? I, I mean, look, um, we believe that um, there's no need for this to escalate, right? We have said that. I said that at the top, to answering to uh, one of your uh, colleagues answering a question. Uh, and look, we understand that the humanitarian situation is dire. Uh, in Gaza. That's why the, pres the president of this administration has led in getting uh, humanitarian aid in. That's why we're continuing to work on this hostage deal, get a ceasefire, uh, and we're going to continue to do so. And it was obviously it was an important conversation uh, that the president had uh, with the prime minister. Thank you, Karine. Um, two questions. The first is on those IDF strikes. I know that you said that the strikes just happened, so you can't comment specifically on those, but broader on the trajectory of this conflict. It's been the goal of the U.S. not to have the world widen since October 7th, and President Biden and Prime Minister Netanyahu just sat down together last week. Was the president, was his team surprised by what's happened in recent days? So again, I'm not going to get into immediate uh, comment on the idea of strike, uh, so that, that's something I'm going to do at this time. And again, as it, we speak to uh, escalation, potential escalation, uh, the questions I've been I've gotten about all-out war, uh, we do not believe we do not believe that an all-out war is inevitable, and we believe that it can be avoided, and that's why it's important to get to a diplomatic solution here. Uh, and but so, did the president get any sense during that meeting last week that a diplomatic solution was within reach? We want to work and focus on getting that diplomatic solution along the blue line and that is important. We want to see these attacks from Hezbollah end and uh, for all and uh, for all and allow Israelis and also Lebanese citizens on both sides of the border uh, to be able to return homes uh, to their lives and to you know live in safety. And so that's what we want to be. That's what we want to be. And so diplomatic solution is the way that we want to see the direction of this. And we do not believe that an all-out war is inevitable here. Uh, but as it relates to the obviously the, the strikes that just occurred, uh, I'm just don't have any immediate uh, comment on, on this at this time. And then on the personnel front, President Biden obviously himself served as the vice president for eight years. He handpicked Kamala Harris for that role nearly four years ago. What level of input, if any, has he provided as she undergoes that same decision? Look, he was asked this question directly, the president at 1.15 a.m. on the South Lawn. Uh, he responded to it, so I'm going to let the president's word speak for itself. I don't have anything beyond that. Go ahead, Karen. Um, I'm going to try this, and knowing that you can't answer <laughs> but I'm going to ask you if you can answer it from the president's perspective, like how he feels about the vice president's first week plus out on the campaign trail. Um, like, What does he think about the fundraising she's done, the events she's done? Done and what he has seen so far. I'll say I'll, I'll say this. Um, obviously, the president and also being mindful about talking about election. Um, obviously, the president endorsed uh, Kamala Harris, the vice president, for a reason. He thought she would be ready on day one. Uh, this is someone who was a senator, who was an attorney general for the largest. Uh, uh, state in, in, in the country. Uh, she has been obviously a vice president for almost four years. 
Uh, she is immensely qualified uh, and, you know, the president having been a senator and a vice president himself, uh, understands what it takes, what it takes. And he sees that in her. Uh, so I would say he's not surprised. He's not surprised. Um, and I'm going to leave it at that to not get myself in, in too much trouble. Okay, so, so, uh, is, yeah. is he watching any of the Olympics? Like, has he taken in anything? <laughs> I said it because, like, my phone is blowing up. So, like, what is It's been great so far. The Olympics has been so great. Yeah. Um, look, the president and the first lady are certainly proudly cheering on uh, Team USA. Uh, as you saw, the first lady travel <coughs> to, oh, bless you, travel to Paris uh, to lead the delegation, the U.S. delegation for the opening ceremonies and cheered on Team, to, team, uh, uh, team USA. And you saw her out there uh, being very supportive. And so the, pre the president certainly is proud of, of all the athletes competing on behalf of the U.S., on behalf of our nation, and he's going to continue to, to cheer, cheer them on. Following up on that, did the president see oh, the Last Supper controversy at the Olympics? Do you know? Did he see I, I, the? I don't have anything. The Last Supper I appreciate the question. I just don't have anything. To Millions share. of Christians across I, the globe were offended by it. The president is Christian. Was I, I he just offended answered your by question. it? I just but was the president offended by it? I just, I just answered did, your question. Did I just ask him? Did he, did he see? Just, I don't have anything else to add. Did to he see it? Did he? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I have a foreign policy question, but just to follow up yeah, on sure. uh, Jackie's question. If Supreme Court reform does not pass, and it seems unlikely under this Congress that it will, what does the president hope his effort will accomplish? Is it to get the American people used to the idea of the need of reform? Is it a message to Justice Roberts? What, what does he think this could ha uh, this I, would lead to? I will say majority of the Amer American people support and want to see uh, reform, right? They want to see this. This is where majority of Americans are. And I will say this, the president and the vice president believe that uh, the rule of law is the foundation of our democracy. It is the foundation of our democracy, which is why the president took action yesterday and he's calling on Congress to do the same. Now what we welcome is a debate. As we've seen many, as many times as the president introduced uh, legislation or some ideas on how uh, the direction of a legislation that's important to the American people. We see a healthy debate. I listed out moments ago when I was uh, having uh, a back and forth with Jackie here, uh, conservative legal experts who support, for example, term limits. Uh, and so I think that was important to note. Senator Marco Rubio, who I also mentioned, who's a, obviously a current senator in the US Senate, support the term limits. So there are ways that we can work together. I'm not going to get into what that legislation is going to look like. We're going to have a healthy debate. We think that's important. But we're talking about the rule of law here. We're talking about the rule of law, which is the foundation of our democracy. The president is going to say something. The president is going to make sure that is protected, as he has done. That is one of the reasons uh, he decided to run. Uh, that is one of the reasons uh, of, of the, the work that we were able to do. 2022, the rule of law, democracy, was one of the top issues that Americans cared about. Would it also be a message to Justice Roberts? I'm not going to get into messages to, uh, to uh, the Chief Justice. That's, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the right thing to do. We're talking about the right thing to do here. And on the foreign policy side, there's reporting that North Korea could conduct another nuclear test to coincide with the U.S. election, uh, the presidential election. How concerned is the administration about this? Is this a real threat? Do you have a message to Pyongyang? I'm just not going to get into hypotheticals from here. What's your next question? Um, on today's sanctions on Iran that Treasury announced, yeah. uh, individuals and entities related to its ballistic missiles and drones program. Can you speak about the timing? Today, uh, the Iranian new president is being sworn in by the parliament. So look, what I can say, this is something that the Department of Treasury uh, did. They announced new sanctions, as you just said, targeting five individuals and seven entities based in Iran, the PRC, Hong Kong, uh, that have facilitated procurements be uh, behalf of our Iran's military uh, forces. The designated entities have been involved in procuring key components of Iran's uh, ballistic missiles and U UAV program. These sanctions are part of, you've heard us talk about sanctions before, especially in the last three and a half years. They're part of our ongoing efforts uh, to counter 
Iran's destabilizing activities, including its arming of proxies in the Middle East and its enabling of Russia's war in Ukraine. You've heard talk, talk about this. Uh, again, this is part of uh, announcements that we, ongoing uh, efforts that we've had here in this administration, and that's how I would view it. Nothing specific on the time. It's ongoing. This has been ongoing sanctions that we've had throughout this administration. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Met with leaders Schumer and Jeffries about legislative priorities for the remainder of this the six months, as you discussed. Yeah, uh, don't have any uh, meetings or conversation uh, at this time to to read out or lay out on on conversation specifically on the next six months. But again, this is something that the president's taken uh, very seriously. He wants to continue to deliver uh, on behalf of the American people. That's what you're going to see him do in the next six months. He will articulate this on what this is going to look like specifically, what he's going to focus on, and I. I think uh, what you saw yesterday uh, was a clear indica indicator of that. He'll be giving remarks at some point, sort of articulating the vision yeah. for the next six months. Any well, timeline on when that might I don't happen? have any timeline. I said he will articulate that. Uh, we'll see what that looks like. Uh, but look, he wants to certainly, and I think this is a little bit of, of um, Kelly O's question to me, uh, he certainly wants to get out there. Uh, he wants to continue to uh, to talk directly to the American people. And again, just bringing in my friend Matt Pfizer here, uh, there is a re-collaboration here. We're trying to see what that looks like, what that's going to look like, um, uh, uh, what he wants to focus on. And so just, you know, give it a sec. Give us a second. We have a lot to focus on. But I would also say, you know, there's these historic pieces of legislation, whether it is um, uh, whether it's the bipartisan infrastructure legislation, as we know, there are thousands of projects out there that we want to make sure that gets implemented. There's the Inflation Reduction Act. There's Medicare, who continues to negotiate with Big Pharma. We want to make sure that on, on medication, on drugs that are important, making sure that the prices go down. We're going to continue to do that. Uh, there's the, the uh, Chips and Science Act, where that's going to bring investments into this country. We want to see uh, that, those big uh, uh, pieces of uh, legislation that obviously are now law acts that we want to see implemented uh, and so that's always been a priority of this president and so that's certainly going to be continue to be so okay I know I keep cut I know I, I just like the second time I'm just, I know I I conjured you up to ask a question I've, I've called your name out many times today. since we're watching that recalibration yeah. in real time uh, <laughs> that's the word of the do, week. You, do you have a sense on what the president is doing today like what his schedule yeah. is like today yeah. or for the remainder of the week and no and I Appreciate that question. I have I have something to share with all of you. And I said he's going to continue. The president is going to continue to work for the American people day in day out. That does not change. Uh, it is extremely important to him to continue building on his accomplishments and finish the job. You, you saw him on the road yesterday for over 12 hours in Texas, and he spoke with reporters. I've been mentioning many times, uh, many times during this uh, this uh, briefing at uh, one o'clock, one fifteen in the morning, taking some questions. Look, he has a call with the president of Brazil today, uh, which will have have a readout, as I mentioned, a completed readout once we are done. Uh, once he's done having that conversation, the president will receive his regular presidential daily briefing. He's going to do that this afternoon and meet with his national security team. And tomorrow, the president will be briefed on the implementation of important provisions of the Inflation Reduction Act, and we will actually have more to come on that, so stay tuned. We'll have more on that later today. Uh, he will also receive a briefing from senior officials on the administration's new actions on ongoing work to crack down on drug trafficking. Traffic smuggling deadly drugs, including fentanyl, into the United States and efforts to beat the global opioid epidemic. And I should have mentioned this before, uh, as when I was asking about the vice president, he will indeed see the vice president tomorrow. He will have lunch with her uh, tomorrow, as they regularly do, as I said. They stay in regular uh, contact as, uh, uh, as she is a critical partner for him in how he moves forward in this administration. All right. Okay. Go ahead. Hey, thanks. Thanks, Creed. So the national debt uh, crossed $35 trillion for the first time ever. Um, the amount being added to the debt seems to be increasing at a, at a growing rate. Um, today we talked with Fitch uh, and they told us that the credit rating agency and they told us that large fiscal deficits and increasing debt burden were key factors to the downgrade that the U.S. had last year. Is the president worried about another downgrade because our spending um, is, is more than the money we're taking in? Yeah, so let me just tick off a couple of things if I may um, and, and, and want to be super clear about this. Uh, the president signed a $1 trillion uh, 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 of deficit reduction into law, and his budget would lower the deficit by another $3 trillion. 
by making billionaires and uh, biggest corporations pay their fair share and cutting spending on special interests. That was an action that the president did. The prior administration increased the debt. Let's not forget what the prior administration did by a record $8 trillion and didn't sign a single law to reduce the debt deficit. And that's what we're dealing with right now. And on top of that, you have congressional Republicans that to continue to want to blow up the debt, uh, again, with $5 trillion more in Trump tax cuts uh, while making hardworking uh, families, uh, uh, you know, uh, pay the price by cutting Social Security, Medicare, and Affordable uh, Care Act. And we want to do the opposite, right? The president's economic agenda, uh, we want to make sure that we put middle class family first, hardworking uh, families first, and congressional Americans want to give more tax tax cut to the rich, to the billionaires, to the corporations. So the president has taken action to try and lower uh, the deficit, and Republicans want to balloon that. And $8 trillion, $8 trillion uh, from the last administration, and they did nothing, nothing to try to make sure that we lower the deficit. But, so you're saying that, that, that we crossed $35 trillion because former President Trump's administration, I mean, that was four years ago, um, you know, the debt keeps increasing. Yeah. You know, at what point? The fact is... It, the fact is, $8 trillion was what the increase in debt was what the last administration did, the Trump administration. They didn't put forth, they didn't put forth any type of legislation to counter that. They didn't. They just let the debt balloon by $8 trillion. That's it's what they, but that's what they did. The president, but what I, but, and what I'm saying to you is like, we can't, we can't discount what happened in the last administration and we can't discount what the, this president is trying to do to make sure that we address this. One trillion dollars in deficit reduction into law, that's what the president signed. Uh, and, uh, and that would lower the deficit by three, another three trillion dollars by making billionaires and the biggest, the biggest corporations pay their fair share. Republicans are offering the opposite of that. So I think policy matters, what we've been able to get done matters. Uh, I'm not discounting what you're saying, I'm just saying the president is actually working to make, to lower the deficit, and Republicans want to do the opposite. That is where we are when we think about the policy, that is where we are. Uh, and I think that matters as well. I know I, I have to get going. Go ahead, sir. Uh, thanks, Karine. You, um, in the beginning, you mentioned the importance of press uh, freedom, yeah. like the uh, like the case of uh, Evan Gershkowitz, Austin Tice, Yu Yudong. Um, we we see that the press freedom itself is extremely important issue uh, worldwide. Um, in the case of Mongolia, considering the fact that the foreign minister of Mongolia visited just seven days ago, um, it seems like the. The, there's an increased fear of the degradation of press freedom within the country. In the case of uh, Unersetsek uh, Naran, uh, Mumbai Chulandor, it's, uh, it's, it, it, is, it is a big concern. Um, is the, in, with the increase of U.S.-Mongolia relations in the upcoming future, is press freedom, is the issue of press freedom going to be mentioned a lot more into the conversation? And then also at the same time, uh, given the fact that it seems uh, the Kremlin or Beijing uh, influence has reached into the country, would this be a point of concern for the Biden administration? I think we, the last point, I certainly we've spoken to that at length about uh, mm -hmm. certainly uh, our concerns. Look, when it comes to the freedom of the press, this is something that the president is never afraid to talk about uh, with any uh, with any world leaders or leaders uh, more broadly. And that is something that he has done. He's had those conversations. He certainly has said it publicly. And what he says publicly, he certainly says privately. Uh, not going to get into specifics of conversations of that particular relationship, but he understands. He understands the importance, the importance of the freedom of the press. Uh, it is important to have that. It is part of our democracy. We've been talking, kind of, kind of the theme of this uh, briefing has been democracy, right? And being able to be able to, uh, to lead on that uh, as a country. And that's what we've been doing here. And we're gonna continue to do that. Uh, and again, he's going to have those conversations. Uh, he's gonna say what we're saying publicly, certainly privately as well. All right, guys, I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.